Cinema Jaw is sponsored by Overcast, an independent podcast app that embraces the open world of podcasting instead of locking it down. No exclusives, no premium content, no paywalls. Just a great podcast app for everyone. Get it for free in the App Store. And we thank them for their support. Listening to Cinema Jaw, the greatest movies podcast ever, recorded on location from our respective homes in Chicago. My name is Matt K. With me is Ride the Movie Guy. And this week on Cinema Jaw, Matt, we head home to make our top five lists. Our top five favorite movies in which the character goes home. So, Ryan. Were you like a, a kid that moved a lot as a, as a child, or you pretty much like were born and raised in one place? Yes. Born and raised in one place. I did not move around at all. In fact, my parents uh, moved into the house when I was three years old, and I was in that house till I went away to college, came home to that house, and then moved out eventually to the city. All that time was in that same house. Wow. How about you? Well, so, I mean, I'm not like a member of a military family or anything, so we didn't move a hell of a lot, but we moved about four or five times, three of which were pretty big for me. We moved from... New Jersey to Connecticut, and then from Connecticut to Michigan when I was a teenager. And that one was especially painful. So I can relate to this going home thing, you know, because after that move, I was always trying or in my mind thinking about going back home. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a relatable emotion. Right. And to clarify for the jawheads, we're not talking about movies where the characters are trying to get home. This is where the characters actually go home to a familiar place. It doesn't necessarily have to be home, but maybe an old school, an old camp, something that was familiar to them a long time ago that they returned to. Exactly. This ties into the movie we're reviewing this week. Yes, we are reviewing I Used to Go Here. And to help us with that review and our top five, we have a great guest who's going to be joining us. Yes, Jeff York, film critic and artist, will be back on the show, I think for his third time. Great to have Jeff back on the jaw. And Matt, since we're talking about the movie, I used to go here in which the main character goes back to a college. I figured this is a good time for you to take Jeff on in college professor movie trivia. Think of movies characters that were college professors. Okay. Wow. We are getting seriously esoteric here after 10 years of trivia. Have to dig deep every once in a while, Matt. And speaking of digging deep, it's August and we had to come up with a new theme. All of 2020, we've been celebrating actresses, actors, directors. Just most recently, we did Spike Lee and then Charlize Theron. And so August, we're looking at the calendar. And as you know, they are changing things rapidly. So oh, you, yes. you, you look for a moment and you say, hey, we're going to celebrate this actor because they have this movie coming out. And right when we are about to write that down, pencil it in, there's a headline, that movie got switched to September and so on and so forth. But there is one big movie that we know is coming out because it's coming out on Netflix. Those are the ones to watch these days. Yeah. And that movie is Project Power. So that's the hint there, Jawheads. Matt, the reveal here, who are we celebrating this August? We are celebrating the great Jamie Foxx here on Cinema Jaw. That is great. I'm a big fan. Yeah, Jamie Foxx getting his own month here. It'll be fun to learn some facts, maybe do some poll questions. Make sure you check out our Facebook, Twitter, all that good stuff. Instagram. We should start with the Jamie Foxx fact. Indeed. All right, Ryan, how about this one? Jamie Foxx is only the third male in history to receive two acting Oscar nominations in the same year for two different movies. He did it in 2004 when he was nominated for Collateral and Ray. The only other male actors to achieve this feat, Barry Fitzgerald in 1944 and Al Pacino in 1992. Wow. That's impressive. I, it is impressive, and he's among good company, although I have to admit, I have no idea who Barry Fitzgerald is. N- nor do I, nor do I. But I did see that uh, there's been, I think, seven actresses that have pulled off the feet as well, hmm. um, but three males. But that's good company right there. It, well, yeah, hoorah. Mm. Jamie Fox Month. I like it, Matt. Me too. 
We ready to get this show rolling here? I'm ready, Ryan. Without further ado, we bring in our guest. As you mentioned, Matt, he is making his third appearance on Cinema Jaw. He is the writer over at theestablishingshot.org. Jeff York, welcome back to Cinema Jaw. Great to be back here, guys. Thank you for having me. Jeff, what is new in your world? I mean, we've all sort of been <laughs> sitting around in quarantine. I'm sure we'll get to some of that later, but what's going on with you? Well, get this. Uh, in the last uh, five months, I've written a pilot and uh, for a TV series that a couple of producers are developing and help them develop two other shows. So I actually had work these last five months. While so many people didn't, I was very fortunate for that. My time is now up on that. Uh, so looking for other freelance writing work, continuing to review movies for the establishing shot.org, which is such a great looking website uh, that Matt created for me. Bravo. Oh, well, I get you, so many compliments on it. Good. And then just waiting to see if uh, they can work it out with uh, what other networks or platforms they're trying to, to sell the shows to, but they liked my work. Uh, they've been following my screenwriting for a while. I helped them uh, back in January on the development of a TV series or two, and they liked it enough that they asked me to write the pilot for this new series they're developing. So it's been kind of a entertainment time uh but you know it's also been strange with the pandemic and being home and worrying about what's going to go on in the world from day to day so it's been sort of the best of times and the worst of times in a, it, in a lot of ways it, is it a sitcom or serious uh show? well it's a serious it's a sci-fi series which mm. they're those are kind of rare these days but it's um based on a a, a book by arthur c Clarke, so oh. it's got a big name attached to it and it's a series of books that were done and they're hoping to maybe do a few seasons out of it. So I can't talk too much about it, but suffice it to say, I was working with a couple of um, big time producers who have done a show on Netflix and some other shows before, and they had confidence in me to take the first stab at the pilot and help them develop the series and sort of the plotting and adapting the book and figuring out what was worth keeping and what was maybe worth, you know, fiddling with some. That's awesome, that's, man. Yeah, that's it was really, really fun. That's really cool. It was really, um, really an honor to do it and fun too. Hard work, but but fun. And it, it certainly uh, was a nice distraction from, you know, having to watch the news all day and see those terrible charts and graphs. My yeah. God, you know. Sure. Mm -hmm. Jeff, turn into watching movies yes. since... I'm used to seeing you at uh, these movie screens. We run into each other it's been usually forever. weekly, right? And now we haven't seen you in a long time. What's it been like now that you haven't been able to go to the theater? Uh, do, you, do you set a set time that you watch the movies at night? Do you watch them during the day? Your movie habits changed? You know, it's a great question. Probably more often than not, I watch them during the day. It's funny, though, because, um, you know, you have to be a little more mindful of what is coming out because, you know, obviously there aren't the, as many screeners and, and screenings and things like that that we get invited to. It's been a little bit hit or miss, I found, though, as far as the content, because I think that some things that have come out are really terrific and then other things I haven't reviewed because I watched them and went, I don't know if I want to waste another two two hours writing about that. You know, they haven't released all the best stuff. There's been a lot of good stuff out there and plenty of small films that were worth seeing. But um, I do miss sort of the, the bigger pictures or the ones that had a little bit more worthiness to them, at least as far as attention for their subject material or their size or whatever else. Not saying that smaller films can't have that. But you know what I mean? I mean, there's been a few weeks where I've looked at the list on the VOD and Emma and the invisible man. And some of those are still there because there's just not that much new coming out. Now, maybe that will start with Mulan coming out um, in a couple of weeks on VOD and some other things I think, which are going to be forced to, but it's funny how Hollywood has been sort of very, very timid and reluctant to sort of join in the VOD world, even though they've got a, a captive audience, not just yeah. a, yeah, at home here in, right. in the USA, but worldwide. And I think they've kind of missed that opportunity to, to play to those large yeah, numbers I, at home. I should mention to the Jawheads, we will have Hollywood headlines where we talk about the Mulan news and also AMC Universal news and so forth. I was over at the establishingshot.org earlier today, and I noticed right on the front page, there is an article that says five reasons why 
Palm Springs is the year's best comedy. Jeff, is this going to make your top 10 at the end of the year? It is. And I tell you what, I'm a hard person to make laugh. I like to laugh. And I, uh, if it's a good comedy, I will laugh. But I was surprised at that one. Um, I haven't seen too many good comedies, so maybe it's a little bit of a grading on the curve. But I thought it was really clever. I did not expect it to get right into the story the way they did, to have three people who were going through the time warp and everything. And while, yes, it was mindful of a few other films that have gone into that sort of uh, sci-fi fantasy world. I found it funny and fresh the whole time and, and wasn't quite sure how they were going to get out of it. So I, I find my, found myself laughing and enjoying it a ton. So yeah, that was one of the biggest and most pleasant surprises this year for me. Oh, we enjoyed it as, as well, oh, for good. sure. Yeah. <laughs> Thank the Lord for the streamers. I mean, Netflix, yeah, Amazon yes. Prime and Hulu have saved us during this pandemic. They have. And, and we can talk a little bit more about that later. But I think, you know, some of the success stories on those platforms have really given the, the go ahead to movie studios to start releasing films on VOD and, and reap some of the same benefits. But they haven't as much yet. But we'll, we'll get to that, I'm sure. Oh, later. yeah. We're, we're going to open this can of worms all the way because there's a lot to discuss. <laughs> there is. It is. There is. It, there, it's going to be a great Hollywood headline segment. Um, sure. I think I'm going to get ganged up on here by these two. Uh-oh. But, um, Yep. Um, But for the jawheads that want to read more about your reviews, check out some of your art, uh, which is fantastic. Where's the best line to, uh, where's the best place to send them online? Uh, Go to theestablishingshot.org. You can also find me, I'm on Rotten Tomatoes. If I really like a movie, I tend to do a caricature of it. If I really like fellow critics, I tend to do their caricatures. Of course, uh, <laughs> I've done both of you for your Cinema Jaw logo. Uh, and you were both terrific to- uh, subjects or topics, I guess. Rather than just, you know, the, the, the art that you get from the publicity companies and such, I thought it gives it a little bit more pizzazz to sort of have me interpret and sort of show what I thought of the, sh- the, the film through that kind of measure as well as, you know, the words and, and the critique. It's working, man. Uh, your, your artwork is fantastic. So oh, thank you. Thank you. So I much. highly encourage the Jawheads to go to the website, check out Jeff York's stuff. Do it indeed. Uh, Jeff, you probably heard at the top of the show, we're celebrating Jamie Foxx this month, yes. October. So you're the first one out of the can and putting you on the hot seat here. Okay. What is your favorite Jamie Foxx performance? Well, it's funny. Um, I've always thought that really good comedians make terrific actors. And I'm surprised how many good dramatic performances Jamie Foxx has given. And my favorite performance you mentioned already is in Collateral, um, as sort of an everyman cab driver who unfortunately picks up the worst fare he could possibly have, a man who's going on a assassin spree that night with Tom Cruise, the Natalie dressed gray haired um, out of towner. I thought he really held the film together and was believable and, you know, made us identify with him the entire time. And You know, we tried to figure out how he was going to get out of it, wondering how we would if we were in the same position. And it's funny, he was still interesting and funny and sweet and all the things, uh, even though he wasn't really able to do any imitations or do his shtick. But I thought he really was terrific in that film. And ironically, because they were pushing him for best actor for Ray that year, they put him in supporting actor for Collateral. So Jeff is going to be sitting in on this entire jaw. He has seen the movie I used to go here and he has his top five films picked out where characters go home or return to a place that they were familiar with or, or grew up in. Or a state of mind, Ryan. Right, doesn't have yes. to be a place. Yep. I agree. I agree. Always open to interpretation here. On and Cinema I did Jump. broaden my list to sort of include both those kind of, you know, touchable, tangible things as well as a state of mind in a way. So good. Good. Try to come up with a mix for you. This is why we like having Jeff as a guest. Yes, Thank he thinks you. outside the box. <laughs> Jillian Jacobs, who most people will know from the television series Community, stars in the new indie comedy, I Used to Go Here. In it, she plays a writer who returns to her college for a reading and ends up getting involved with a group of students down there. Matt, Jeff and I sat down to see if this latest film is worth a peek on VOD. Guess where I am? Where? In Carbondale. Welcome back, right? David Kirkpatrick brought me down to do a reading. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Kate was in my very first class ever as a professor. How's your book doing? Not as good as I would have hoped. What would you think about teaching here? Teaching here? It would be nice to have you here again, Kate. 
I used to live here. Seriously? <laughs> We're having a party. You should come. I used to dance in this room like 15 years ago. I was in kindergarten 15 years ago. The whole thing is very restrained. I can go for a little restraint. Oh my god! You want to see something? Yeah. I Used to Go Here opens up with Kate Conklin, played by Jillian Jacobs, finding out that her book tour has been canceled. She has just recently had her first novel published, but sales and interest in the book caused the publisher to scale down promotion. We also find out that she's going through a breakup with a guy she was engaged to. Whew, things are not looking good. <laughs> then she gets a call from an old college professor of hers. David Kirkpatrick. You got to love that name for a college professor. He invites her down to do a reading at Illinois University, the school she graduated from 15 years earlier. For people familiar with Illinois colleges, Southern Illinois University in Carbondale plays host to the fictional school in the movie. Kate arrives thinking there may be more to this invitation. We find out she was infatuated with David when she was a student there. However, those feelings are quickly squashed when she is introduced to his wife. The film really picks up steam when Kate gets invited to a party by students who live in the same house she did when she attended school there. From here, characters develop and plot points move this film into very funny territory. While the plot of I Used to Go Here might not be the freshest, the characters we meet make this a fun trip back to school. My two favorites of this group were Tall Brandon, who, from besides being tall, is awkwardly hilarious, and also Elliot, who is a student assigned to driving Kate around while she's on campus. I found myself thinking about these characters the day after the screening of the film. I love that. These are a group of people I would like to have a beer with and maybe even a swim with. <laughs> Matt, was I used to go here a fun college experience for you, or did it feel like it was a course you've taken before? Well, Ryan, I think you need to stay after class because there's a ton of details you missed about I used to go here. First, this is a Lonely Island production, which continues a great year for Andy Sandberg and company, who we were just talking about. We're even treated to a hilarious cameo by Jorma Tacone. Second, this is written and directed by a woman, and not just any woman, Rye, but Chicago indie film royalty, Chris Swanberg. And in her capable hands, we finally get to see a midlife crisis from another gender perspective. And surprise, surprise, it's just as funny. So many films have been made about the male midlife crisis that one could be not faulted for thinking that it was a strictly male phenomenon, but she flips that script and delivers stunningly. Third, you mentioned Jillian Jacobs, from Community, but you neglected to mention Jermaine Clement from Flight of the Concords, What We Do in Shadows, among many other films and TV, and Hannah Marks, slightly lesser known, but some jawheads will know her from Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency, for the sci-fi fans out there. Uh, and I wasn't as familiar with the rest of the cast, but I sort of fell in love with all of them. They're just imbued with this character and comedic warmth. Fantastic job from all of them. In short, every bit of this film is of the highest street cred indie pedigree, and it actually delivers on that promise big time. I love movies that tackle these themes, and while midlife crisis movies, you're right, might be common enough, I think I Used to Go Here has done just enough to keep it fresh. Kate reminds us that many of us simply pretend to mature, go through the motions of life, like getting a job, adapting your values, making compromises in order to get ahead, even accepting a marriage proposal even if these things run counter to who we are, all in the name of growing up. Once she's back in Carbondale, she regresses to her former maturity levels and feels more at home at the college flop house than the fancy bed and breakfast she's been put up in. Of course, there's a lesson she needs to learn and has to take a step backwards in order to move forward again, closer to her center. The movie is gut-bustingly funny at times and had me smiling nearly its entire runtime. Even though I love these lighthearted, character-heavy comedy romps, I have to say something intangible was just barely missing from I Used to Go Here. 
that would that would have elevated it to instant classic status, like a Dazed and Confused or even Booksmart. The movie gets close, but bare, just barely falls short of those high bars. But it's a minor complaint because I'd take another semester of this class any days. And maybe you guys can tell me, was something missing here? What, what was it that kept this? Or do you think it was an instant classic? I don't think it was an instant classic, but I think it was really good. Um, I liked it a lot. I think the best thing that the film does is it takes a lot of things we've seen many times before and finds a fresh way to deliver them. You know, you know that she's going to find out that the man that she had a crush on isn't worthy of that crush. You know that she's going to probably hook up with somebody in that (laughs) <laughs> that house who's a, a student and you know it might be a little questionable but uh, somehow that's going to eventually get there and yet they do it and they talk about it and they address that kind of very fact and what that can mean it doesn't mean you have to love somebody for the rest of your life and go off with them into the sunset the one thing that i think to your point matt that maybe keeps it from just being a, a little more empathetic is i think that Jillian Jacobs is very funny in it. Um, I think she gives a, a performance of mostly reactions. She doesn't talk a great deal, at least the stuff that I remember mostly are her reactions to other people talking or other things that are being said or done to her, the, the many indignities she suffers. But she has a little bit of a Larry David quality to her, and that is, and maybe it's the way the character is written as well, but she creates her own problems in most of this. And she's not quite a lovable enough actress, at least the way she looks. I think she could play a great villain because she's got a little bit of a hardness to her sometimes when you look at her and kind of a severe eyes, kind of big staring kind of thing that isn't quite as lovable as maybe, say, Haley Seinfeld was, who was a terribly self-sabotaging character in um, her teen angst movie, a coming-of-age film from a few years back, The Edge of 17. Having said that, I think she is hilarious in it. She gives a very good performance. But I think if there's anything that maybe makes it a little bit hard to love as much as some others, it's because both her character and her performance are just a little arm's length. Um, So maybe that's part of it, but it's very funny. And I think the twists they take and the fact that we get to know all the supporting characters and find out what they think and what they think about school as as well as writing and stuff is is very funny. I, I also have to say as somebody who writes and you guys write for this show too, the slams about writing were hilarious. Like how about when uh, when David, the teacher says to the one kid after he reads a short story, he goes like, that's really good. I just want to give you one small little note. I think you need to lose the whole first part of it. Cut a couple pages out. Yeah, <laughs> like, just, just how throw it away. Was, how long was that story? But you know, the little note yeah. is like, lose the first two pages. Yeah. That's such a writer's thing. Uh, you know, or like change the title because one word titles, they really aren't selling now. No, her <laughs> book isn't selling right now i don't think there's any case study that shows that one word book titles aren't selling but that's a lot of the kind of criticism you get from people who are in the industry trying to make sure you don't have a better time in the industry and that goes for so film critics screenwriters or novelists oh this is this is a really good dig on critics there too when she reads a bad review and then goes to a bar yes Jermaine Clement's like, they're the worst people on earth. It's, it's fantastic. <laughs> but I, I, do, I do agree with uh, Jeff that she's, she's a little like standoffish and, and sort of self-sabotaging. Do you mean her character or her? Her, her character. Oh, okay, her okay. Character. Yeah. I agree yeah. with that. Totally. Yeah. But she, um, she plays it a little cool too. I mean, she doesn't, she's not trying to sort of beg for you to, to love her. It's not a needy performance. She's a very good sign of a, a, an accomplished skilled actor who doesn't, play outside of the character to try to get you to like her. She's not interested in you having to love her more than the, that it is on the page, but because of that, she's maybe just works well with that frostiness of the character. Yeah. I do want to mention that I love when there's awkward moments for humor. And one of them you're mentioning, obviously she has this problem with the the cover of the book. And when she goes to the reading, which nobody in the class would would have ever looked at the cover of the book, but this is how she starts. Well, I hate the cover. Then everybody looks and it's that awkward moment. I love those kind of moments. And there's also that scene where she meets a fellow student that she went to school with that is working down there and they go out to what Kate Conklin <laughs> thinks is possibly a date, right? Uh-huh. She, she's under the impression like, hey, we're going to have a date. And this guy ends up confessing something to her that is so awkward. 
Outrageous. You know, that's the lonely. That's the oh, guy from God. Lonely Island, yeah, right? Norma yeah, Norma Yeah, that's right. I, I was laughing. It, it's that like I, I felt like bad for everybody on screen. Like I like that though, you know, because it's yes. awkward between everybody involved, but yet it's it's utterly hilarious. Yeah, this movie is stuffed with those with those awkward moments. I don't know if I agree with you completely, Jeff, about Jillian. I I actually think she's cute. Maybe yeah, that's yeah. just me with the the upturned nose. I, <laughs> in fact, if anything, I thought that she was too close in age to the college kids. Mm, like we were supposed yeah. to believe that. And, and I guess the math works out if you look at her actual age. But like she looks younger than she is. I guess. But no, don't get me wrong. I did like her. But I mean, I think like compared to somebody who she even looks a little bit like is um, Emma Stone. I mean, Emma Stone with that's her fair. big eyes is so you just you want to hug her because, you know, she's so vulnerable even when she's being kind of nasty like she was in The Favorite. But Jillian is a very disciplined actress. She plays it as the person who is, yeah, a little bit unlikable and self-sabotaging. But maybe I, I think as a heroine, she's a little closer to... Larry David than Emma Stone maybe and maybe that's oh yeah but it no might that's make her a little bit cooler <laughs> or cold I think or, that know. is a great observation the the Larry David thing is actually perfectly puts this into context <laughs> yeah I, I mentioned a, a couple reviews back I'm a big fan of when they throw in nicknames that are very natural and this movie is chock full of them and especially this tall Brandon and <laughs> when when I went to college we called a guy Tall Mark so. I, I think that's why it's so funny. We had two guys, you know, named Mark, and one was just humongous. So everybody's like, oh, Mark's got beer in his dorm room. And it'd be like, uh, Mark so-and-so, no, tall Mark, you know? Right. I, I love those kind of, like, quick nicknames and references. I think that's very natural. And tall Brandon in particular, when we're first introduced to him and he comes out uh, in just a towel, uh, again, is very awkward. I love that humor. And, of course, I think the funniest – seen in the movie being when tall Brandon is doing lookout at the house and ends yes. up getting involved <laughs> with, the mom. with the mom. God, that was hysterical. Oh, they're parting. I don't want to give anything away because it is the best moment in the entire movie. It their is. parting was like, you, you think it's going to happen and then you're pretty sure it's not going to happen. And then when it does happen, I was just laughing out loud. It was very satisfying. So true. And, and you know, one thing I'll say too, in, um, to compliment the th um, the Lonely Island trio, and it's evident in Palm Springs as well as this movie, and, and you can just tell in sort of the projects they take on or, or appeal to them. They not only really develop the characters, and a lot of characters are on them, even if they only have a handful of lines, they give them very specific things to say and do that make them very memorable and specific and they do that here too and like for example when they introduce that tall character he's wearing a towel and they make a joke about like you know he seems to be preoccupied with hey are we going to order beer for a party and then he stands there for a while and um, you know she's embarrassed and somebody says well are you are you going to get dressed and he goes i'm still a little bit wet and he yeah. says it totally rationally like you know like and, and you just sort of understand that this guy would be standing there in a towel and not realizing that he's, you know, entirely exposed of really to yeah, them all. Making people uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, making people uncomfortable because he's waiting to air dry. I mean, that just sell, tells you so much about the quirkiness of him. So, yeah, he's a typical college student who wants beer. That's the easy, typical line that most screenwriters would write. But the kind of stuff that Andy Samberg and his friends do and, and Chris did here in writing and directing this film uh, – go beyond that and giving the extra spin that gives the character more specifics, something that's a little bit unexpected and, and even more funny because it is so out of left field, but, but also real because people are that quirky and eccentric. That's yeah, where, in college. <laughs> that's where this movie shines is, is finding those quirky eccentric moments and, and uh, bringing them out. Yep. Yeah. And I really liked Kate, the character's uh, arc. I love that question near the end of the movie where they ask her, well, what would you think of your book? And it's the first time someone actually honestly asks her about the book yeah. and not to spoil it and what she says. But I like that whole arc uh, of where she's at at the end of the movie, from where we first met her to where we leave off with this character I thought was great. I did too. It was, it was yes. fun. You got a movie poster quote here for me, Matt? They used to make movies like I used to go here. Don't care for that at all. <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, that's too wordy on a movie poster. It's not wordy. I, I like well, you're all. supposed to make a pun, dude. I went with, uh, like a college town, small, quaint, and fun to play with. 
I don't know. How is a college town fun to play with? I don't know. <laughs> How about you should go to I used to go here? See? Now, Jeff just beat us both right he there. It. Off he the cuff. It. I used to go here is available on video on demand. I think all three of us would recommend renting this one. Going around here, Matt, how many jaws on a four jaw scale? So, so I really enjoyed this movie. And I mentioned that there's just something missing that, that kept this from, from a book smart or dazed and confused instant classic status. So I'm giving it three and a half jaws. I really enjoyed it quite a bit. Jeff? Uh, three out of four. I liked it a lot too. Um, not quite a classic, but a very solid, clever, worthy comedy. Absolutely. I, I'm right with Jeff. I think Matt, to be honest, is a little high on it, but that's totally okay because I'm a fan of this movie as well. I'm giving it three out of four Jaws as well. So strong recommend here for a VOD title. Gives <laughs> the Jawhead something to, to rent and watch. I, I think a lot of people too, looking for like a spark in life. We're all down in a rut right now. Yeah. It's got that theme in there. So, it does. Uh, it really does. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a it's a good movie to rent. I used to go here, being the fact that Kate goes back to her college campus and has this uh, familiar area that she roams around in yeah. the movie. That was our top five this week. Jeff, you're getting us started. Uh, you said that your list might be a little outside the box, so. <laughs> What do you got sitting at number five? Well, uh, well, indeed, I am thinking outside of the box, although I stayed quite literally to the idea of somebody returning home in this one. In fact, the tagline for the poster for this movie back in 1978 was, the night he came home. And indeed, it is Halloween in 1978. That, that was the tagline for this horror classic. And uh, it is about the return of murderer Michael Myers, who comes back to his hometown of Haddonville, Illinois. It's um, a fictional small town, but uh, anyway, he gets there and uh, builds on the slaughtering of his teen sister from decades ago and goes on a rampage. But the body count is fairly small compared to what most horror movies are today. He only kills five other people in the movie, even though it was sort of regarded then as the first slasher mover movie because of that. Uh, but it's very, very little on screen green carnage or blood but john carpenter wrote it directed it and even scored the film and for those uh jaw heads out there it would they may be interested to know if they don't already that the mask that michael myers wears is actually a william shatner captain kirk mask that the costume designer found painted white and thought it looked kind of scary for myers to wear so um you'll never look at michael myers the same and maybe not william shatner as well <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I love that factoid, man, about yeah. William Shatner. Gets us started strong with a number five <laughs> pick. Even, even the, the kind of toupee-ish hair. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's a classic mask at this point. It is. It is. Matt, what do you got sitting there? I have one. I think you guys are going to give me a little guff on Sweet Home Alabama. Wow. Wow. I can't believe this is on Matt Kay's list. I can't even believe Matt saw this movie. It's an honorable <laughs> mention of mine, but I'm shocked you even saw it, Matt. Uh, I, <laughs> I did see it. And I, why are you so shocked? It's like a movie that I watched with my parents. You know, I was probably still, I, I wasn't living at home in 2002, but you know, let's say there were frequent visits still at that time. I was a fan of Reese Witherspoon, like everything about it kind of clicked, not from the South personally. So I couldn't relate to some of that stuff, but I think Sweet Home Alabama is actually, it transcends its, its locale, if you will. It's, it's more about that feeling of, of going back home to like your small town when you're, you're, you get a little too big for your britches and you forget where you came from to find your core, to find your roots, to find the values that made you who you are. I think the movie captures it pretty well. Reese Witherspoon is very charming, and I think she does elevate that material, even if it isn't maybe in the top tier of Witherspoon films. But I agree with you, Matt. She's, uh, she's money in the bank. She is. She, uh, she absolutely is. It, it does have that great line in the movie. It was in the trailer, and even in the seeing it in the trailer 15 times and then seeing it in the movie, I still laugh. When she goes to uh, a bar, she meets an old uh, classmate. She's like, oh, my God, you have a baby in a bar. 
<laughs> it's just funny. fantastic. Yeah, it is I love good. It. Swings it over to my number five. This was a small movie that came out back in the year 2000, starring Laura Linney and Mark Ruffalo. Oh. It's directed by Kenneth Longeren, who did Margaret and Manchester by the Sea. The name of the film is You Can Count on Me. As mentioned, Laura Linney, Mark Ruffalo, they play brother and sister who lost their parents when they were younger. And Linney plays Sammy, a single mother of a young boy who actually stayed in their hometown in upstate New York. Meanwhile, Ruffalo plays their sort of like wild brother, Terry, who's traveled the country. He's a bit of a mess. And he comes back to visit his sister in the house that they grew up in. And he hits it off with her son, who's missing this father figure. Um, and he sort of supplies that role, but also sort of like almost like a big brother to him as well, because he does not at all have the best parenting skills. But of course, there's a bond there with uh, his nephew and he takes him out and it's very touching. And then also the brother and sister sort of reconcile. All the while, Laura Linney, on the surface, it looks like she's the stable one because she was at home and she's raising this kid. But she starts to have an affair with Matthew Broderick, who is a, oh, wow. is a worker of hers. Broderick uh, is in this? Yeah, Matthew yeah, Broderick yeah. is in it as well. Also in the cast, Amy Ryan and Josh Lucas. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, it's actually a smaller, quieter film, but heartwarming but at the end of it. Uh, but it's interesting too, right? because it kind of put the three main people on the map. I mean, 100%. that was the first time that most people had ever heard of Laura Linney outside of the, the theater community in New York. Same with Mark Ruffalo. I mean, he was kind of the big find there. And I dare say Kenneth Lonergan. I mean, he had been a playwright and been writing other things. But the success of that movie and the fact that it figured in some awards competition and uh, year-end critics list that year really sort of established him as a, a, a filmmaker. So For sure. It was a small film, but it was a small film that kind of did big. <laughs> yep. And I, I was definitely one of those Mark Ruffalo fans from seeing the movie. I didn't know who he was. And he definitely was, the next time I saw him, oh, that's the guy from You Can Count On Me. You know, I was starting to get to know who Mark Ruffalo was, but definitely from that movie for sure. Right. Josh Lucas, speaking of Sweet Home Alabama. That's right. Mm-hmm. He, was the, he was the boyfriend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. The man that All got right. away. I had You Can Count On Me at number five, so we go into our fours. Well, this one is a little bit more of a traditional movie, uh, not too far off of the one we discussed tonight at length. Uh, it's a 2011 movie called Young Adult. Again, another great performance by uh, Charlize Theron. She got applauded for playing real-life villains Eileen Warnos and Megan Kelly, but her greatest film performance in my book is actually the anti-heroine she played in this film. Uh, she plays Mavis Gary. Uh, the film was written by Diablo Cody of Juno fame and directed by Jason Reitman, who did Up in the Air. And her character, mm-hmm. after some personal loss, is not unlike our main character from tonight, uh, including uh, losing a lucrative gig writing young adult novels, kind of similar in theme, uh, she decided to go home and try to reclaim her boyfriend from high school because she was a big deal back then. So her ego needs it and she thinks she can rest him away because he wanted her so much back then. So she wants to go back and try it again. It's a black comedy, uh, the kind that you definitely cringe all the way through because Mavis acts terribly and Theron is rather fearless in the part, willing to be ugly on film both inside and out. There's a couple scenes where she reveals kind of what's underneath her facade of beauty and it's uh, kind of shocking that uh, she was willing to go there Uh, but it says a lot about an actress who's willing to play such vile female leads as this one as well as a serial killer and a fox cable host Mm -hmm. and one one actor uh, um, yes one (laughs) one one actor not mentioned in your uh, summary there is pat noswald so terrific in it he's unbelievable in it. I think this is his best, as far as a movie goes, I think this is his best role. Uh, He's terrific in obviously television shows and his stand-up, but for a film role, I think this is his best. And he he plays a guy who was picked on in high school who ends up actually befriending and even more so uh, Mm -hmm. Shirley Theron's character. It's spectacular. I love Young Adult. Was it one of your choices, right? It it was, yeah. Oh, it, it, it may come up later, in. yeah. Because I, I feared that was going to be one that we'd probably overlap. On. Yeah. No, that's it's great, Matt. What do you got sitting at four? All right, uh, at number four, I have a movie I've talked about a lot, so we don't have to belabor it. But Beautiful Girls just oh, cannot yeah. be passed on for this category. The whole movie is about Timothy Hutton's character going back home, 
and reconnecting with, you know, old flames, some new flames, though questionable though they may be. <laughs> um, and all these characters, uh, Matt Dillon plays the snowplow driver, you know, the guy who never quite made it out of the small town and stuff. It just, I don't know, maybe again, because of my moving, I connect to movies about going back home and, and finding this group of people mm. still there doing the same things in the town. And, and I liked it. Also, Natalie Portman, a very important uh, step in, in her career being in this oh, movie. Right. Uma Thurman pops up. Uh, Michael Rappaport. Rosie O'Donnell. The, yeah, the cast, the cast is deep and it's good. Mira Sorvino. I, I love this movie. I, I still have not seen this, but... It, and Timothy Hutton as the lead was very good in it too. And he was a little spotty as he got older as an actor, but he was very good in that as well. Probably his best, honestly, yeah. my opinion. You know, yeah. At least since Ordinary People, probably, yeah. I, I still have not seen this. It's on my queue, and uh, I think I have it in the uh, digital uh, cloud. So I will see this, Matt. It, I, I intend to watch this. It's a damn good one, man. My number four pick came out in 2004, also stars Natalie Portman. Hmm. That's weird how we keep doing that, Ryan. Very the stars strange. connecting oh, I know pick what to it pick. Is. Right. But the comparisons stop there. <laughs> this one was written, directed, and stars Zach Braff, who at the time when this came out, I thought, oh my God, Zach Braff's going to have his run with Hollywood. Well, he was on top. Yeah. It, it more or less slowed down to a screeching halt after this one, but he did give us Garden State in 2004. Yeah. Uh, Zach Braff, like I said, uh, stars in the movie is Andrew who's a struggling actor who is out in LA. And when we meet him, he's working at like a, a sushi restaurant, struggling to get by as like a waiter. And he gets a call that his uh, mother had passed away and he needs to come home to New Jersey. Hence the name of the movie Garden State. And it, it's about a lot of things, obviously it's it, returning home and he meets a couple of friends. And uh, these friends, one of them is played by Peter Sarsgaard are actually the grave diggers at the uh, graveyard in which they're they're digging the hole in which they're going to put his mom's casket and he gets invited to a party things start to open up for him we start to learn you know some some of the darker sides of his childhood and uh, causes of his depression and being somewhat of an outsider and on a trip to the doctor's office he meets sam who's played by natalie portman who is a compulsive liar uh very strange kind of girl, but they hit it off. Next thing you know, the shins are playing and everybody's cool. And it seemed like a short music video after a short music video, but <laughs> I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I, I hate bringing the, bringing the, the, the show down, but I, I've talked uh, before, like I've lost my mother and I remember uh, watching this and really being emotionally into the movie because of uh, a lot of the themes that are presented there of like losing a parent, going home and, and feeling almost like you don't have a home anymore. And I totally related at that time of what he was speaking about. So from there, it's always been a special movie for me. What's interesting about Garden State too, is I think it's like the matrix for indie film. Like it was a game changer for hipster indie film, right? There's what the matrix was to action sci-fi garden state was to that, whatever genre, if you want to call it, that is, you know, young man coming of age, kind of uh, post-college. I, I guess it's, it's, I mean, we've heard stories like that prior to, but I think sure. it was the style in which it was presented. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it was a bit of a, a landmark film in that way. Mm -hmm. And maybe to use a phrase from that era too, kind of a slacker coming of age, if you will, you know, a different generation as opposed to right. the angry young man from the sixties or the self-absorbed me decade guy from the seventies, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Agree. That was my number four garden state. Jeff, what do you got at three? All right. Uh, this is going all the way back to 1981. And this is a little bit more of a return to sort of a mindset or at least a, or at least a group of friends that kind of allow you to sort of return to your youth. And that is the big chill. <laughs> oh, nice one. Thank you. Uh, in this movie, a rebel from a college uh, a group of friends commits suicide and they all gather together to mourn his death as well as the passing of their own innocence and youth. Uh, it starred William Hurt, Glenn Close, Kevin Klein, Jeff Goldblum, Joe Beth Williams, 
Tom Berenger and Mary Kay Place. And a lot of those people became big stars out of that film. They play the aging college hipsters and radicals. And in many ways, this film kind of signaled the death of the Kennedy 60s and the coming Reagan 80s. Uh, it was written by Lawrence Kasdan and Barbara Benedict, and Kasdan also directed it. And uh, the story kind of was a sad one as they came to realize that maybe they weren't exactly the same people with the same ideals that they were then. But the one thing that they could hang on to is that even though they changed, they still found enough to like in each other and, and remain friends, which I think was kind of a, a big statement because people do change and stuff. So even though it was a little bit of a cynical film and maybe took down some of the 60s counterculture, you can't go home again, but at least you can still have your friends and do some really awesome drugs with them. <laughs> That's why that. by the William Hurt character. That always makes it for a great movie, doesn't it, Jeff? <laughs> I tell you. Hey, you know. or a great weekend, if you know. <laughs> That's right. Like uh, the big tall character in the dorm was asking, where's the cakes? You know, are we having the beer? Where's the party? <laughs> Good old tall Brandon. Tall Brandon. All right, swings it over to me. I'm going with a 2015 film from Trey Edward Schultz, who did a movie called Cretia which was yes. about a woman who had been struggling with substance abuse mm -hmm. and, you know, pills and alcohol and stuff and such just sort of the black sheep of the family, but she's trying desperately to get it together to make it through one Thanksgiving back home with her family. Uh, she's gotten chance after second chance after second chance. She makes this attempt, tries to reconnect with her estranged son and, the movie, what I think makes Cretia so special and different is it's very much a, um, a family drama shot like a horror film. Like mm -hmm. it is shot and played in, in the completely as a horror movie. Like you feel so tense and there's so much dread dripping from this, but it's not a scary movie. There's nothing paranormal going on. It's just about a woman and her substance abuse problems dealing with family problems it's stuff that millions and millions of people go through but the way that trey edward schultz who is actually a character in the movie as well no. shot this and, and put it on the screen it just it becomes something different something special i, I don't it's think great. he's a character in the movie he is he plays um he plays the son as a matter of fact unless i'm mistaken hmm. we'll throw, we that throw, that, box. throw that in the job box yeah <laughs> i could be wrong about that but i'm pretty sure and while we're in the jaw box, we'll look up. Uh, we had Cretia Fairchild on Cinema Jaw, so we'll look up that number of episode. Let the Jawheads, they want to hear. Krisha. Yeah, she she was a guest. That's true. She was. Um, swings it over to my number three, and if I have uh, a stranger pick, I don't know what what it would possibly be. This seems like it would not be a movie I would like. I think it's a, a memory that I have of watching this movie uh, with my best friend and his mom. And it was really his mom's choice. This is 1993. And the film centers around eight adults returning to a summer camp that they used to all attend when they were young. And now they're all returning to the summer camp. And believe it or not, the camp director is uh, played by none other than Alan Arkin. 1993, the film is Indian Summer. Yes. Jeff, Never you know seen this it. one? I do. Yeah. I did see it. Yeah. Get it was kind of one of those um, movies that sort of put Arkin back uh, in the in play a little bit before Little Miss Sunshine and some of yeah. those. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I watched time. I watched a couple of scenes um, getting ready for this, and I have to say, I think if if Jawheads hadn't, haven't seen this movie and they put it on, they're going to be like, "Oh my God, is this a cheese fest? What a cheese ball of a movie!" But <laughs> having watching it. Back in, in sometime in the 90s, I saw it on, on video, I know, and my friend's mom and her friend was watching it and we were in the room and they loved the movie and we loved it because it was funny. Um, the cast, get a load of this, Matt, Diane Lane, Bill Paxton, Elizabeth Perkins, mm. yeah. Kevin Pollack, and Sam Raimi. Boy, that's a 90s cast if I ever heard one, man. Sam Raimi. <laughs> Kevin wow. Pollack. Is that um, Sam Raimi acting? Oh, the usual Sam suspects. Raimi acting, correct. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I looked up on Wikipedia and Sam Raimi was friends with the director of Indian Summer. And so he got involved and actually acted in the film. It's eight friends. They go back to the camp that they all went to. And of course, it's a lot of memories. They want to be young again. But also, they're dealing with uh, you know past 
issues emotionally that they never had resolved the last time they saw each other. Again, one of those heartwarming, best way to say it, a cheese ball 90s movies. But talk about returning home or somewhere familiar like a camp like that, Indian summer. Good pick. Very Into good. our number twos we go. Jeff, what do we get in there? 2009 movie that actually won the best foreign language film that year called The Secret in Their Eyes. And if you have never seen this one, I recommend hmm. you do it ASAP because it's extraordinary. It's a really terrific thriller, like I said, from Argentina. And it's about a police detective who returns to Buenos Aires and the courthouse where he once worked for a judge there and a case of his that has remained only half solved for the past 20 years. Um, he's decided to write about all of it in the biography, uh, sort of chronicling the autumn of his years, and it all still haunts him, including the girl that got away who just happened to be his DA boss. She's a comely woman who still has eyes for him and he still has eyes for her and there's secrets in those eyes and other characters as well. There's lots of twists and turns. It has one of the greatest chase scenes ever filmed in what is to be believed as one long take, though it's actually tricky because there's a couple trick shots in it, but they blend it together. And of all places, a Buenos Aires football match in the, in the stands and also a rug pull climax that I don't think you'll ever see coming. You may have heard of this because it was remade uh, in a terrible botch called um, Secret in Their Eyes that starred Julia Roberts and uh, Chiwetel Ejiofor a few yeah. years back. Skip that one. It's going to burn your eyes if you see it, and you'll never unsee it. But seek out and watch the original neo-noir instead, The Secret in Their Eyes. Nice. I have seen uh, both versions. The remake is terrible, Jeff. You That's are terrible. absolutely right. And yes, I, I would say it's even it, it's a masterpiece. I, I love that uh, foreign film. I agree. I should mention that it was written and directed by uh, Juan Jose Campanella, uh, who did a lot of time on Law and Order, directing many shows for that series back in the 90s and into the, the new millennium. Uh, and he co-wrote that with Eduardo Sacheri, who wrote the original book, which the screenplay was based on in Argentina as well. You know, what is Cinema Jaw for, if not to introduce people to films they haven't seen and yeah. should see. And that's exactly what happened to me when we celebrated Anne Hathaway a few months oh, back. Yes. And I came across a movie of hers that I just somehow missed. Rachel Getting Married, Jonathan yes. Demme's 2008 film. It's just an amazing film. And really, got to give it to Hathaway here. She is the heart and soul and center of this movie. Another one about substance abuse, a woman played by Hathaway, is going home to attend her sister's wedding after spending some time in rehab. Right. And she's very brash and unapologetic. And when she gets home, she expects her room to be exactly how she left it. Very self-centered person. But as we come to get to know her and exactly why she is the way she is and the things she's been through, uh, there's some pretty devastating beats in this movie. Mm -hmm. And then when it culminates in the wedding, that shot, I know, Ryan, you complained a little bit about it being too long, but I found it so satisfying. There's this extended wedding scene. I believe it's all one take with the dancing and the vows and everything, the celebration. And it, it might be 15 minutes long. And I think that's great because the entire first 90% uh, of the movie is about Anne Hathaway's character. And then we finally get to this wedding scene at the end. And it's the first time in the film that it's not all about her. And she doesn't need it to be all about her. So love this one. Very much about going home and, you know, dealing with the ghosts that live in the, those spaces figuratively. Yep. Good pick and a total tie-in to my number two, as it also is about a character who was in rehab, dealing with substance abuse, returning home. Unbelievable, Matt. But uh, this one came out only two years ago. 2018, we failed to review this one on Cinema Jaw. I think just time constraints. Stars Julia Roberts and Lucas Hedges. Mm. Ben is back. Oh, yes. Yeah. And this is yeah. where uh, Lucas Hedges plays the title character, Ben, who arrives back to his house unexpectedly. And um, Julia Roberts at this point is uh, remarried, has two daughters with this new husband. They agree to take Ben back because they didn't want him out of rehab. I mean, he's, he's, he's in a troubled area and a troubled time in his life where they don't want him uh, just being at home. 
you know, a mother and her son, she doesn't want him to just turn around and go back. So she says, you can stay with us for 24 hours, you know, through Christmas, but you'd never leave my sight. I mean, you just can't leave my sight because it's, it's who knows what could happen. Take some shopping and what happens He's like in the, the dressing room and meet somebody. And next thing you know, there's possible, you know, drugs exchanged. And, you know, it's very sad because he's in that vulnerable uh, state at the time. But even worse, the family then goes to church later that night. And when they come back, someone's broken into their house and stole their dog, the family dog. What? And, and this is clearly because they know he's home. You know, he's got this lifestyle of hanging out with druggies and people that he probably owes money to. And so they know that it's something to do with him. That's why their dog is missing. So Ben and Julia Roberts, the mother, then go to try to find the dog. And by doing so, they sort of go through all of the stomping grounds that Ben has been through. And some of those are really sad sights and memories that they have of things that he's had to do uh, for drugs and for drug money and all the rough things. Uh, Terribly sad, rough watch. And I'm not going to tell you it ends happy either, but terrific performances, both from Lucas Hedges and Julia Roberts. And I, I, I think an important one because you turn on the news and I mean, there's, there's drug issues all across the country. So important one to watch. Nice. Good, Good pick, man. Excellent. Yeah. That was my number two. Here it is. Cinema jaw. We're talking about going home, Jeff, take us home with your number one. Well, I would be remiss if I did not cover at least one war movie about returning soldiers. Uh, it's done so well in everything from things like the deer hunter and coming home to, uh, all kinds of movies from the World War II era. And my favorite of that era is The Best Years of Our Lives, uh, a 1946 movie considered the one of the best war films ever and perhaps the greatest tribute to The Enlisted Man. Uh, it was written by Robert E. Sherwood, based on the bestseller Glory for Me by McKinley Cantor at the time. And of course, it was directed by the great William Wyler. Uh, it's a sensitive study about three men returning to their hometown of Boone City, Michigan. Frederick March, Dane Andrews, and Harold Russell play the GIs, who are all having difficulty adapting to civilian life after the end of World War II. March's character is a banker who finds himself now at odds with sort of the uh, cutthroat and cold-hearted corporate America. Yes, they were making fun of corporate people back then uh, in films like that, and It's a Wonderful Life and many others. Andrew's character even has a rougher go of it. Uh, He was a big commander over in Germany, and now he can't get a better job than being a soda jerk because there was an employment issue with lots of GIs at the time, and so he's sort of stuck in, in that kind of existence. And then Russell is a former high school football star who has lost his arms in the war. Uh, and he returns and feels that he doesn't want to burden his girlfriend with his handicap. And there's a lot of self-loathing to him. But, you know, it's heartbreaking. It's also hopeful. And it's kind of a searing drama of really looking at what it meant to go and sort of give your blood on the battlefield and give up some of your mental state and confidence to to do such battle. Um, Interestingly enough, despite his Oscar nominated performance, Harold Russell was not a professional actor. Um, This was his first role. And when the uh, Oscar voting was getting going, the Academy Board of Governors considered him a long shot to win. So they decided to give him an honorary award for, and I quote, bringing hope and courage to his fellow veterans through his appearance. But not only did Russell get the honorary Oscar, but he was nominated for supporting and won it. So here's another bit of trivia. He remains to this day the only actor to receive not one, but two Academy Awards for the same performance. <laughs> wow. Uh, here we go with uh, with my number one. This is the movie that gave us Jacob Tremblay. We say, like, this movie will leave you breathless, right? But when I watched Room for the first time, I was sitting in the theater, yeah, fantastic. literally couldn't breathe at certain moments of, of the movie. Yeah. Um, but it's very much about going home from two different perspectives. Of course, um, Brie Larson's character, who's been held captive in this shed-sized room for, for years, mm. finally escapes with her son, who's lived his entire life in this room. Now she's going home to her parents and uh, having to deal with this trauma that she's endured for so long. And the boy is being exposed to the outside world that she didn't even believe existed uh, for the first time. Now he just wants to get back to the room, back to room and back to his home where things made sense. 
and you know she needs to reassimilate and deal with with life and the realities of of what's happened to her and it's just a it's amazing movie and neither of those stories overpowers the other they just sort of happen in this perfect unison there's this bond between them as mother and son that's fantastic the movie will slay you at times and then at other times just fill you with love and hope it's it's just a complete roller coaster of a movie and one of my favorites of all time it's a great one uh it really good, is good Fantastic. pick my number one spoiled by jeff york um <laughs> Sorry, Which, guy. yeah, I, I, it, it's always rough to have it spoiled, but when it's spoiled by Jeff York, it's, <laughs> it's just, it's just that much worse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was young adult actually was my number one uh, pick. And, you know, we were celebrating Charlize Theron last month. I, I remember looking at her filmography and thinking it, this is maybe one of her most underrated uh, yeah. performances because it is dark and you're right. Once the sort of mask comes off and we see what sort of driving her, underneath how, how sad and ugly uh, that really is. Young Adult was my number one. I'm throwing in an honorable mention. This is sort of a strange pick that I came across. It was sitting on my queue for a long time. I think this played at the Chicago Critics Film Festival maybe four or five years ago. I can't even remember. And I finally caught up with it. And it is about three adult women who used to go to this little island off of the coast, uh, off the East Coast. And they, they would go there uh, like camping and whatnot. And uh, right when we meet these three, the two of the actresses are Lake Bell and Kate Bosworth. Mm-hmm. And they come together and there's a, a riff between them. And we get the idea that one of these women was with a guy that was involved with one of the other women and they haven't really talked. And now these were three best friends when they were younger and now two don't talk. So the, the one that does talk to both of them tries to get them together to go to this old campground off of this little Island off the East coast. And they take this little boat out there and the idea is like, Hey, let's camp. But while they get out there uh, to sort of rekindle these memories, there comes across a a group of uh, three soldiers who just returned from uh, Iraq war and they're definitely a little off and it turns into basically a horror movie. Black rock is the name of this movie. Black rock. It's streaming on Hulu. Worth the spin. It's worth the spin. It's, it's probably 85 minutes long. Any honorable mentions else that we missed? I, Oh yeah. I got a few. I got a few. It, first of all, it, <laughs> yes. you could take the original or, or the new one to take your pick gross point blank. Really wanted to put it on this list, but I talk about it too much. Also talk about Romy and Michelle's high school reunion far too much. <laughs> World's End, another one I talked. Oh, very funny. Um, Home, the animated film. Never saw it. Oh, right, it's right. right. Right in the title there. And then uh, last but definitely least, Come to Daddy, the Elijah Wood film from this year. It's also... <laughs> he does come home. He does come home. Yes. <laughs> oh, wow. Um O- only good. ones not mentioned on my list were uh, Brothers. Oh, yeah. Which was the another Natalie Portman movie. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, The Majestic with... Oh, Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey, which is really not that he came home, uh, the sort of twist on that one, because mm. uh, he's not really from the town. It's That's a strange movie. Mm. I got to watch it again. It's been years <laughs> since I saw it. If we missed your favorite movie about a character going home and spending time in a familiar place, and you have Twitter pulled up, Shoot us a tweet at CinemaJaw, or you can always email us feedback at CinemaJaw.com. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, big Hollywood headlines. Jeff's going to break it all down for us. He's got all the answers. (laughs) And Jeff is going to take Matt on in Professor Movie Trivia. Stick with us. We kick off this month-long celebration of Great Jamie Foxx with this scene from Ray, in which Jamie, playing Ray Charles, talks with his record executive, played by the great Curtis Armstrong, about the mess around. All right, fellas, that's a cut. That's a cut, fellas. Fellas. The bank can take five. You just don't get it. All right, kids. You either sound original or you've got nothing. Ahmed, what'd you think of that? 
Ray, I want to tell you something, and I don't want you to take it wrong. <clears throat> then give it to me right then. I signed you because I sensed something special in you, not because you sound like Nat Cole or Charles Brown. Well, I thought you liked what I did. Uh, we, we love the timbre of your voice. We like your virtuosity, your energy. But I'm a music. Come on, man. I didn't say that. Hey, look, man. I mean, this is what I do, man. I got to make a living. I, this is what the people want. I, I don't know no other way. Well, we got to help you find one. Look, let's try a little change of pace, okay? You're familiar with stride piano? You kidding me, man? The man that I learned the piano from is a stride player. Okay, I got a song. Uh huh. It's called "The Mess Around." The Mess Around. Cute title. Who wrote it? I did. Ah, you wrote it. Yeah. Well, sing it to me, man. Sing it. Yeah. It ain't like I can read the lyrics. Okay. Well, it's uh, key of G. Okay. Key of G. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, but it's a, a kind of Pete Johnson thing. It. You like that? Okay, yeah. here we go. Two, three. Four. You can talk about the pit, barbecue. The band was jumping. The people too. They're doing the mess around. They're doing the mess around. They're doing the mess around. Everybody doing the mess around. All right, that's pretty good. Let me take it from here. Now this band's gonna play from nine to one. Everybody here's gonna have some fun doing the mess around. back on Cinema Jaw, hanging out with Jeff York from the establishingshot.org. Now, Jeff, we've talked about your movie reviews, um, that you write these reviews, and you go to the establishingshot.org to find more. But your artwork also, uh, I know the Jawheads, if they're ever interested probably in a, a particular character or a caricature that they see on your website or a movie that they love, uh, you do do commissions, correct? I do. In fact, if they see anything on the site that they would like, ask. Uh, it may be sitting in a folder in my home. So uh, sometimes people pay for them or ask for them or I send them celebrities, but oftentimes I don't. So if there's something they see there that they like, it may be available. All they have to do is uh, contact me and ask, and they can do that through the the establishing shot.org or if they would like a commission of their favorite actor or movie or show or themselves or their family dog contact me uh all kinds of places i'm on instagram under jeff york chicago or jeff york caricatures and they can dm me directly there or they or they can contact me through the establishing shot.org nice do it jawheads i mean you would be in such company as spike lee who's purchased uh his caricature or it was the black Klansman uh drawing that you did right 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 um yeah my work is hanging in the um Homes of Antonio Banderas and Brian Cranston and a number of people from The Young the Restless. Uh, Charlize Theron complimented, but she never uh, asked for it, even though she liked the drawing I did of her and Seth Rogen in um, Long Shot. But uh, all right, uh, Matt. Before we get to trivia and before we get to these Hollywood headlines, we did throw a couple items into the jaw box. Let's open up that jaw box. What's your pleasure, Mr. Cotton? The box. We got a box. Oh, what's in the box? All right, Matt. Only two questions. Uh, and they both had to do with the film Cretia. Um, mm-hmm. The first one was: Was Trey Edward Schultz the director, also the star in the movie playing Trey? You are correct, Matt. He is. Uh, Thank you. I was mistaken. Yeah, he was in the film as well. Yeah, I wouldn't uh, call him the star, but he's no, he's in right. it. Yeah. Right. I shouldn't say he's the star, but he is in the film. And then also looking it up, uh, Carisha Fairchild, who is the star of the movie, came on Cinema Jaw as a full guest, not just an interview, but came on as a full guest. And that was episode number 310. So wow. uh, just go to cinemajaw.com, look up our, uh, wow. our old episodes there. Number 310, Carisha Fairchild. That was a great one, too. Yeah. Wow, I did three ten. It feels so long ago. This is episode number four eighty one. Wow, you guys rock. Uh, we're certainly consistent, if nothing else. <laughs> I think you're terrific. 
Uh, that's everything in the jaw box. Let's close that jaw box. Matt, there are major Hollywood headlines uh, going on that we need to break down for the Jawheads sure. here. Let's start off with something easy. All right, here's an easy one for you guys. Get to wet the whistle. This is the uh, appetizer, if you will. Nia DaCosta, who directed the anticipated reboot of Candyman, has been tapped as the director on Marvel's sequel to Captain Marvel. I'm just upset that there is a sequel to Captain Marvel. Why, why is that upset? Well, you're not upset about that. <laughs> there are going to be a lot of them. I'm <laughs> There's going to be at least three, right? I'm not that upset <laughs> about it, but um, to be honest, I, I think this is a uh, quarantine. Obviously, it's, it's stunted a lot of things in the movie world, but to me, uh, not being that involved in the Marvel universe, it seems like it's really stunted the Marvel. Like I haven't even thought of it at all, or I don't care that much about it. So when I hear a headline like that, and I'm very glad. I mean, I think the thing, the main part of the headline is that, you know, we have a, a, a female, a minority getting a, a great opportunity to, to you know, make a, a big budget Hollywood movie. It doesn't get any bigger than Marvel at, at the current time. But at the same time, I really don't care about Marvel right now. I, it's like, what? Oh, yeah, yeah you never making did. Marvel movies? I forgot that they're still making them. What do you guys feel? I miss I miss it. I mean, we we were robbed of a of a true summer movie season, and we're going to be robbed of a true Oscar movie season. It's just it, this year is a bit of a wash, right? For for many many things, not just the movies. It's weird to think that we've had no summer movie season, and all those temples that are sitting wondering whether they're going to make it into the theaters, possibly, or just go to VOD and some sort of pay per view kind of scheme or whatever remains to be seen but um you're right it's uh marvel and think about all the disney shows that they had that marvel was uh developing uh the thing about loki and wandavision exactly all those different things all that got stalled too so even the disney platform can't get the the shows out that's one of the reasons i think if you don't mind me going into just uh, the segue into Milan, I think. Well, well let's go there. Let's go here. Second yeah, Milan one. is being released um, on D- uh, VOD, I think, yeah. September 4th. Yes, here It'll it is. Charging September 4th. People- and it twenty nine ninety five to watch it, and you have to subscribe to Disney. So correct. there's a few strings attached to it, but it's a a movie with a great deal of buzz, and I think um, Disney's doing it for a couple reasons. Some very very financial and frankly understandable i mean they haven't been making revenue they own abc there's not going to be any new shows coming up for the fall of too much uh, at least scripted shows because everything shut down and disney world and disneyland have had openings but you know not big and they've lost a ton of money and again no summer movie season so no pen poles no big ones but milan which has really good buzz is ready to go and i think they're saying let's see if we can make some money, some hay off it. I also think because it's been kind of this weird, truncated, not much out there movie season, I think they have their eyes on a couple of Oscars. They certainly, being a period piece, are going to be in contention for production design, score, cinematography, editing, costume design. Let's, and with its female empowerment story, they may be looking and going, hey, we might have a pretty good shot okay. at some but, but big let's ticket stick, items. Okay, yeah. Let, let's stick to the, the idea that Mulan sure. is going to home theater for sure. $29.99. And that you got to be a Disney subscriber, right. um, and what which this is already is, a, which is already an expensive yeah. service, right? Disney, Disney no. Plus, right? Well, no, I think it's like it's seven bucks now because because the yes. they're trying to get subscribers. But yeah, they'll probably raise it if they're successful and and, and keep you going and coming. Now back we've more. seen this uh, was successful with what was the animated movie you watched? Trolls that? World Trolls. Tour. Yeah, it yes. was huge, yeah. huge. But now we're seeing this with Mulan, which if you just go back two, three months earlier, the heads of Disney were saying that they will hold off for uh, a release, that it has to be seen in theaters because of all the work that went into it. They want everybody to see the scope of this movie, and they're going to sort of test the waters with Mulan. As a single guy, I'm taking myself out of doing Cinema Jaw because it's completely different. I'm going to see Mulan we're doing a podcast, we're film critics, I'm going to see it. But taking myself out of it and being a single guy, would I pay $30 for Milan? The answer is no. There's almost no movie that I would pay $30 for. Star Wars? No, probably not. Really? Bullshit. I call you on that On principle. (laughs) On principle, 
Well, I would argue that if you, if you went to see a 3D movie, you're already paying probably $20. And by the time parking and popcorn and all that is done, you've added another 10 to $20 on top of it for a single ticket. So you, Rai, as a single film goer, just go down to AMC if you drove down, parked at that theater, bought some concessions, and walked in to see a 3D movie, maybe Star Wars or otherwise, you've probably plopped out 50 bucks. There's an old expression that says you can never step into the same river once or twice rather because it always changes right i think this has been a very strange swirling water that keeps changing yeah it was great of disney to say it needs to be seen on the big screen just like christopher nolan and is saying about tenon and some of these other tent poles that was three months ago and everybody thought we'd be back to normal by august and that didn't happen and now as the forecasting goes it doesn't look like there's going to be a fall movie season and maybe not a real winter one i mean you know i said this to you guys before we went to broadcast but broadway has already decided that they aren't even going to really figure on a new broadway season until 2021 they've completely said we cannot open our shows in this spiking environment and, and uncertainty of whether we can even put people in the seats next to each other, laughing, guffawing, et cetera, et cetera. So I think Disney, not only do they need to make money, not only do they have a winner on their hands, it is, but I think they're sitting there going, do we hold it till next summer? I mean, they're doing that with Jungle Cruise because that's not quite as much of a prestige film. That's probably just going to be a, a popcorn film. But I think they're now thinking, well, it was fine when I wanted to wait four months, but do I want to now wait 10 months? Do I want to wait a year? I mean, my two cents is this. What took them so damn long? 30 <laughs> bucks, really, Ryan, even as a single guy, Jeff's completely right. 30 bucks, by the time you're said and done going to the theater, whether you take the CTA and you don't buy popcorn, it's still going to cost you about 30 bucks. I mean, really, you're taking the Uber home, you're getting a drink or two or three in your case, Ryan, <laughs> you're, you're not getting out of the movies for, for under $30. Right. So <laughs> if, there's a, if there's a tentpole movie, a must-see movie like this one, Mulan, even as a single guy, 30 bucks doesn't seem completely unreasonable. What I think is a little unreasonable is that you have to be a subscriber. If I'm subscribed mm. to a magazine, I don't need to pay for, t for page 10. I already subscribed. Mm -hmm. So they should give a discount for subscribers or make it that you don't have to subscribe to pay for the movie. Like you have to pay us for the honor of paying us. That seems a bit like a double dip to me. What, one thing that I do hear is that once you pay the $30, this won't be a normal video on demand where you have 24 hours to watch it. If you're a Disney subscriber and you pay the $30. It's unlocked. Yeah, Milan yeah, is unlocked and then, and then it's in your library to watch. Mm -hmm. Boo. No, that sets a precedent that I don't like. Really, there has been a captive audience at home now worldwide for months. And very few films have taken the opportunity to capitalize on it. And the funny thing about that is there is history showing them, immediate history showing them that there is money to be made on this. I'll give you an example. It's a TV series, but it's, a, it's a, an interesting analogous story. And that is the miniseries Normal People, which was directed by Lenny Abramson, the man who directed Room and produced yeah. that. Yeah. Um, they knew they had a good show. It was a BBC Hulu co-production. They knew they had a very good series based on a, a bestseller book internationally. And they completely rejiggered the promotion of it and the publicity all for online during this pandemic. Uh, they did numerous interviews on Zoom calls and stuff like that, which were not classy or elegant the way that might have, might have been if you went on The Tonight Show or, you know, BBC and stuff and talked to the talk show hosts like um, Graham Norton. But they did it. And because people were at home and there was very little else to see when this was coming, I was right at the end of the, the regular um, television season. It made a killing everywhere it went. It was a buzz, uh, buzzy show. It was a water cooler show. And it set records for subscriptions, speeding Killing Eve and other things in England and Ireland. And it did really well here and sold a lot of subscriptions for, for Hulu. Now, I'm not saying that every tentpole is that, but think about a time, uh, no time to die. That was supposed to open in the middle of March, right as the, the shutdown kind of basically started. If they'd opened in May and they had figured out a deal that they could open it like uh, Emma and the Invisible Man all opened on AMC's streaming service uh, as well as VOD and Amazon Prime. Why couldn't they have done with James Bond in different countries? Well, 
stuff is a big pay-per-view, 30 bucks per shot there, open it up, have a red carpet. They might have made $600 million opening it's, I mean, it's, you've got the captive audience. It's not ideal, but in, given the circumstances, it might have been a big way to make this So, and that, that perfectly leads us into the, the third the headline, third because yeah, it's, no, not, sure. it's not necessarily about economics. It's about right. relationships. Do you want yeah. to read it, Ryan? Yeah, the third headline is this, and it is AMC Theaters has struck a historic agreement with Universal that will allow the studio's movies to be, to be made available on premium video on demand after just 17 days in the cinema, which includes three weekends. So they want three weekends in the movie theaters, and then it can go to premium video on demand. How about that, folks? We're going to be getting these movies... Now, right after this is a bigger headline, actually, than the, the Milan, to be absolutely honest, because yeah, yeah, this sure. this is this really could be the death of the movie theater, how this is all no. going to play out anyways. So two things on this one, it's very interesting because I know we think when you hear AMC, everybody thinks it's just, oh, that's the, the only player in town. But AMC doesn't even make up 50 percent of the theaters in the country. So they're talking about one chain. But now what I'm reading is, well, then the other other chains that aren't involved in this deal aren't going to play. Suit. No, but they don't want to play. The, they're, first, they're playing hardball, and they're like, okay, well, then Universal can't play their movies in our theaters, right? So now Cinemark- That's not going to work. Well, let me talk here. Okay, go. Why? Why isn't going to work? So because, as soon as, because as soon as Universal has a hit, uh, like a must-see movie, you think Cinemark or whatever AMC's Regal. biggest Regal, thank you. Like they're gonna need to play those movies. Arc light. I, I I know, but it all this time it's been uh, like the way Jeff was just talking, like it's all the studio's commands. But this whole time's been a handshake with right with the movie theater mm -hmm. industry. So there there's definitely an agreement with that. So. I think they're going to play hardball with it, but if Universal is going to do it, then everybody's going to do it. Yeah. And then if everybody's going to do it and you could either see the movie at home for $20 or go see it in the movie theater for, you know, $5. I know you guys are, I don't know where you guys are going for all your movies, but it, believe it or not, right after work, where I go, it's, it's $4.95 for new releases. You can still see movies at a, at a bargain price, believe it or not. And if they're only going to be available at home for $20, it'll probably work for some, but not all. Well, interesting, if you don't mind me chiming in, the, um, the death of the movie theater has been forecast for going on probably 70 years now. I mean, first it was going to be television, which eliminated movie theaters. It did not. Then it was going to be cable, and it didn't. Then it was premium cable, and then it was streaming. So nothing's killed it yet. I, I think there is still a need and a want to see films that, are on the big screen for a number of things. Community, shared uh, emotions when you're watching something, with, whether it's horror comedy that really benefits from a collective group around you reacting to it as, as this sort of group thing. Uh, same with concerts, same with uh, sporting events. We can watch sporting events at home on television. We can see a basketball game a lot better on our home screens of TV, and yet they still make millions and millions of dollars. So I don't think... The big screen's going to go away. However, I'll tell you what it could do for companies like AMC or ArcLight or whomever else. I think it needs some rethinking on what they can be putting up in the, in the screens. You know, they do the, the, the special events and some of those kind of things where they have like the Metropolitan Opera there or, you know, Mystery Science Theater 3000 returns for Christmas with a, you know, a special event through Fandango, whatever. I mean, maybe there's things that we can be seeing together on the big screen in different capacities that maybe AMC or those other people haven't thought of yet. I'll give you one example. Broadway isn't going to come back until at least 2021. So Hamilton just made a ton of money for Disney and its streaming thing. Why not yep. film other shows? Now, grant you, you make it limited. Like you maybe you only have this weekend to see it or do it like pay-per-view or everybody who wants to see it has one chance to watch it this weekend and you have to pay your 30 bucks and you get 10 million households to watch it, and then it goes away. So you don't keep them from going to New York to see the shows. But there are so many shows that people cannot see because they cannot afford a $100 ticket price for a seat for a Broadway musical. Why not show the people in Montana that in a theater there they were go to just like they would a movie. I think AMC and the movie theater experience needs to expand its horizons on what it can be. And that's going to help them be more crucial and a part of our lives, not less. Matt. 
I don't know. So, I mean, I'm, I might be in the minority here, but I, I think in general, we need to be a little bit less precious uh, about our content. You know, I mean, first of all, Jeff's right about people predicting the death of this, the death of that. Like, it's not going to end movie theaters. Records, record stores still exist. Comic book stores still exist, even though both of those things you can get digitally, probably easier. Yep. People just like that sense of community. Fantastic point about the plays and stuff like that. Like, it needs to be accessible. There are so many great documentaries that, that have an mm-hmm. actual uh, impact on social justice or um, the foods we eat or, you know, right. just, just a couple of topics there. Crimes. But there's crimes, the sure. Exposing of, of, of criminal True acts. crimes, yeah. <laughs> I mean, so why, why, keep the, why make this all so hard to do? Just make it mm-hmm. easy to do. Like art mm-hmm. should be free. And I'm not saying that artists don't need to be paid. They do, but the system can be reevaluated from time to time. And this is one of those times. Hmm. I remember when Silence of the Lambs came out in 1992, it came out in February. And for the Oscar season in November and December, they released it back into the theaters. Everybody had seen it. It was already on cable by then. And, and you could get the VHS copies of it, but they released it in the theater and made enough money of it in the theaters because it was special. And, and they're capitalizing on the interest around, around the Oscars. Um, there's lots of ways for films to open on multiple platforms and make money and be available to all of them. But, if they can reach those people who are home with kids or can't afford to take four people to the theater and spend $200 just to go see Wonder Woman 84, why not make it available to them in three weeks? The people who want to see on the big screen will go there and they'll make $300 million in those three weeks because everybody will want to see it and go rush to it. And those who can't can watch it on TV and everybody makes money in it and gets to see a good piece of entertainment. And those people at home are still not, it's not free, by the way. We're still paying for it too. And thank you. I have been saying that for 10 years to this guy, Jeff. And and, and I do want to- Am I the tiebreaker? I I do want to clarify for the the jawheads on that- uh, reading into that article more. Um, we are talking about Universal then just going to video on demand. Streaming is still, it can't go to like a streaming platform for X amount of months. So it can't like go play at an AMC and then three weeks later be That's, available on Netflix or Amazon. Just so everybody knows what we're talking sure. about. Okay. Yeah. It's a distinction, but it's a stupid one. Not on your part, Ryan, on their part. There we go. Keep the discussion going, Jawheads. Uh, reach out to us. Obviously, this is a topic that uh, is on everybody's uh, mind here. So. Fiercely debated. Fiercely debated. <laughs> Feedback at cinemajaw.com. Keep those emails coming in. You can hear the music playing that. You know that music means one thing. It is time to play some trivia here. <laughs> and in honor of I used to go here, we're a character goes back to a college campus. We're playing college professor movie trivia. Jeff, you're our guest. You get to choose if you want to go first, let Matt K go first. There are steals. And if you get hung up on any question, you get one rescue. Rescue me, Ryan. Wow. I will let Matt go first because he is a great host and a generous, generous man. I'm still going to try to beat you, Jeff. (laughs) That was my little psycho. Like, oh yeah, I can't beat him. He's so nice to me. (laughs) Question one over to Matt K. Matt, this comedian played Professor Turgeson in Back to School. Name him. I'm just going to guess because I don't remember the character's name. But if you're talking about Back to School and a professor, it's got to be Sam Kinison. That's absolutely right. Yes. One to nothing. One Very to nothing, good. Matt K. Question two over to Jeff. Name the actor who played college professor John Nash in A Beautiful Mind. That would be Russell Crowe. Yes, yes. Starts off as a college professor. It is one-to-one. Question three over to Matt K. Matt, Larry Fishburne, also known as Lawrence Fishburne, played a college professor in this 1995 film directed by John Singleton that also starred one Michael Rappaport and Omar Epps. Name the movie. I should really know this, like, right off the top of my head. Yeah, oh, my. Omar Epps, Michael Rappaport, and Larry 19, Fishburne. 1995, right in your wheelhouse, too. I know, it really is. It really is. Directed I, I, by John Singleton, who did Boys in the Hood. 
I, I kind of remember this movie. I, I don't want to use my lifeline yet. I'm going to say this was um, White Men Can't Jump 2. Oh. <laughs> they made a sequel to that one, right? That is incorrect. Oh. Jeff, you got a chance for a steal and to take the lead here. I feel bad. I don't know it. Wow. I think right. this one's a little more esoteric than you think, right? Well, or- it's a little more of a like a sleeper. It, yeah. It, it, it wasn't like popular, I don't think. Lawrence Fishburne. Too, sorry. Yeah, John Singleton in Higher Learning. Damn Higher it. Learning. Oh, we're looking oh, for. Okay. You remember this one, Matt? Yeah, of course. Now that you course. mentioned it, I remember the title. Yeah. Okay. It is uh, it is one to one, and question four is over to Jeff. Okay. Jeff, who played Professor? He was a professor. Robert Langdon in the film The Da Vinci Code. Tom Hanks. There we go. Yes. Yeah. It is two to one. Jeff, question five. Back over to Matt K. Matt. Stalin Skarsgård played a professor at this school where Will Hunting is a janitor in Goodwill Hunting. Name the school. Name the school in Goodwill Hunting. Well, they're that in is right. They're in Boston, Ryan. How do you like them apples? Um, <laughs> I think it's just. Oh, wait a second. Yale is in New Haven, Connecticut. Is it? Is it Harvard? I'm guessing Harvard. <laughs> Damn it. That is incorrect. Wow. Jeff, you got a chance for a steal here and to take a commanding you, uh, three to one league. Shoot, I'm trying to think of my uh, is it Boston University? Ooh. Is it oh, UMass? Also. No, MIT. MIT. MIT's oh, in MIT. Boston. Damn it. That's right. I sometimes fail to remember that's a college. <laughs> Is it Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT? Okay, I think that's right, yeah. All right, here's where the score stands for the college professors out there. It is two to one, Jeff in the lead, and question six is over to him. Jeff, Michael Douglas plays Professor Tripp in this 2000 film that also stars Tobey Maguire and Robert Downey Jr. Wonder Boys. Wow, wow, there we go. Three to one, Jeff. Two questions left. <laughs> Matt, question seven is to you. Mm-hmm. Name the actor who played a college professor in the 2010 film, A Single Man. The film also starred Julianne Moore and Nicholas Holt. Colin Firth. That is correct. A wow. brilliant performance. Setting the stage for the Jawheads. It is three to two. Last question of the game. Jeff, you could put it away right here. You could oh. end it with a, oh. with a win. No pressure. Or give me a <laughs> chance for the tie. Jeff, name. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, name the actor who played <laughs> Professor Dave Jennings in the 1978 film Animal House. Donald. Sutherland. Yes, it was Donald Sutherland. <laughs> I would wow. not have gotten that one right. Dude, if, if this was a visual show, the clue would have just been the picture. Ah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so Jeff wins this one four to one. If it came down to a tie, a jawbreaker, this question would have been over to Jeff. Jeff, Indiana Jones, good professor or no? A very good professor. Yeah, I'd give his that students to you. loved him. Yeah. They wrote, uh, <laughs> yep. they wrote, uh, "Love you" on their eyelids, didn't they, or something like that? Mm-hmm. The real jawbreaker was this age of Donald Sutherland closest to Matt. You got to guess on how old Donald Donald Sutherland is. President Snow himself. Um, <laughs> he is no young man. I would say Donald Sutherland. If he is not in his eighties, he is damn close. I'm going to say he is seventy. Nine years old. Lock him in at 79. Jeff, you got to guess. 82. Give that one to Jeff York. He's 85. 85 Ooh, for 85. Donald Sutherland. Oh. He looks great. He looks he fantastic. And I'm he's still sure doing the work. Still doing the work. Still yeah. doing the work. Fantastic. And it does bring us to the end of a great podcast. First and foremost, got to thank Jeff for coming on. Staying up late. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. I love you guys. Your show is fantastic. Uh, I would be on every week if you'd have me, but I'll settle for once a year. 
<laughs> Matt, we also got to thank our sponsors. Yes, thanks to Overcast and the Chicago Podcast Co-op who help us get great sponsors like them. If you would like to support Cinema Jaw, the easiest way to do so is by leaving us a review wherever you're listening to this podcast. And while you're at it, please click subscribe. It helps us out tremendously. Until next week, I'm Rod the Movie Guy. I'm Matt Kay. And keep, keep on, on jawing about the movies. That's a wrap. That's a wrap. That was so much fun. Thank you. You're the best. We had to do the keep on jawing about the movies now in tandem, and then I edit them together. So that's- oh, I love that. Yeah.